Welcome to Weekly Infusion with Dr. Drew Pinsky and Dr. Bruce Heishober. Weekly Infusion addresses medically related topics. It's in the know, entertaining, and everything you want to know about health and medicine. Now may I present to you the very wonderful Dr. Drew and Dr. Bruce. Hey, welcome to another Weekly Infusion. Bruce, uh, Great. Ha- Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good to see you. Good to be here. I missed you. Um, we're going to do an interesting conversation today. We're going to talk a little bit about dermatology and uh, hair loss, which is sort of an interesting topic that uh, I think you know, when you think about the history of things that men have been preoccupied with particularly, uh, and not just men, but women are also affected by this, uh, hair loss is, it's funny, it used to be, there's so many more effective treatments now. It's not such a source of tremendous anxiety that it used to be. And so much more known. I know in the emergency department, it is a very rudimentary approach and People yeah. come in and sometimes for a third opinion, which is not the place to go for that. But, not. And just my approach has just been a general approach is, you know, obviously chemotherapy induced alopecia or alopecia. alopecia meaning, areata, these are alopecia is just a technical term for loss of hair. Alopecia. Right. And, and most of the time, you know, unless you, you check the thyroid and talk about the stress. So, so hold on. So, so, so there is male pattern balding. Most common. Which is what men get as they age. There's medically related, which is a very complex topic. There's dermatology-related hair loss. There's medication-related hair loss, right? So, the, And these are just general big categories. That right. They can all be broken down into subcategories. Hmm? Right. And, and even, even emotionally-related hair loss, right? They, very common. Mm-hmm. Very common. That, that's usually a patch of hair that goes, goes haywire. And then trichotillomania, which we see sometimes where people which are is pulling hair, their hair out. Hair pulling, <laughs> right. So we, we brought some interesting guests in today to discuss this. Uh, we're bringing, first of all, Bill Edwards. He's the CEO of an over-the-counter product. And the reason, one of the reasons we're bringing uh, Bill in, he's the CEO of Regenix, and he's also a hair loss prevention specialist. We're going to have Dr. Mojave in just a second. He's a hair transplant surgeon. Is sort of talk about the spectrum of treatment. I get very confused by the over-the-counter market. When when I and Bill, welcome to the program. By the way, welcome. thank you. <laughs> uh, when when I first, you know, I was trained on sort of uh, Rogaine and hair transplants, and those were the real, real in quotes options. And people started asking me questions about over-the-counter products or sort of ancillary pr- uh, prescription products, and I got I get confused immediately when I started looking into it. Now, Susan, you have a hair loss issue. My yes, wife, I do. first lady of love. And how did you find your way to Bill's product? Well, I was talking to Valerie, Valerie Allen, okay. who actually had tried the product, said she had pro- product and said she had too much hair for it. <laughs> and I said, well, listen, I'm willing to try that because I'm having a trouble growing my hair back after I lost it when I had hormone treatments. Yeah. And my hair was super short and just sticking out everywhere, and I had brushes full of hair every day and the hair would grow back but then it would fall out again so so you and i have bruce you and i have talked about hormone replacement therapy yes and I've been, you know i've been an advocate for testosterone replacement well this is one of the side effects of testosterone replacement if your dad exactly. didn't have any hair you might inherit that genetic right. potential yourself yeah, and well, yeah oh but yes yeah, so we call him <laughs> dennis the cue ball anyway <laughs> but so bill so talk to us about you know the hair loss generally you're about your research biologist and now you re- you're representing this product so help us understand all this well, you touched on a lot of different we things. We did. And I, I know. A, I'm dumping a, it in your, ca- your, yeah, in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to hit them one at a time. Okay. Um, there's so many different contributing factors that we deal with, and, and you touched on many of them. But within, as you mentioned, those categories, there are different subcategories as well. And the interesting thing, too, is you touched on, on male pattern baldness. Okay, so which let's is, start with that. Which but, is the inherent factor, and that's when... When you have um, uh, testosterone combining with an enzyme that's present in the sublayers of the follicles called 5-alpha reductase, and when they two, those two combine, they form dehydrotestosterone. People call it, you'll see it in commercials, as DHT. DHT, yeah. yeah. And the genetic factor comes into play when in those follicles, there are receptor sites that genetically activate in certain areas of the scalp at, at a certain period of time in someone's life and with certain individuals that have that genetic factor. When the sites activate and there's DHT present, it bonds to the site, information transfers, and the follicles start to atrophy. The interesting thing about male pattern baldness over the years, and I've been in this field for over 30 years now, but back in the old days, it was very, very rare that we would ever see a woman coming into us with a problem. And the problem was always a general diffuse thinning all over. That was what they call female pattern. Fast forward to today, over half of our clients are women, 
And the women that are coming in are experiencing male pattern in in the sense of they're losing hair in the same areas that men traditionally. Is that hormone replacement therapy or other medicines? Stress. Or stress? stress is the big factor. The big. Sorry, factor. honey. And maybe women have more <laughs> testosterone now. That's what, an interesting idea. Yeah. Women are taking testosterone. Well, no, but it's interesting. That maybe we're sort of evolving. In they're evolving. It's, yeah. I always tell you, you, got, you women got to be careful what you wish for. Well, you know what's, <laughs> what's, what's, what's you fascinating gotta... to me about that is we know that men's testosterone levels go up when they're in positions of leadership. You're suggesting, Bill, that women's also do. They've been in the workforce for many That's years. They're so in the upper level executive positions now. Interesting. Yeah. That is no one. I haven't seen any published discussion. No, That's either. fascinating. You'll never see a woman outside. With that, with with a hair problem, then they they've got it covered up somehow with a hat, a kerchief, a wig. Right. It's that's why nobody knows about. They're it. magicians. <laughs> plus, plus with birth control, doesn't that cut your estrogen down aspect. as well? There's well, there hormones are one of the aspects. one of the factors. Yeah. So you know we're taking more and you know. Well, progesterone can have all kinds of effects. Really, we're talking about progesterone primarily, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so why does this genetic mechanism that gets triggered by the DHT? get more present with age or it's, is it just time it's it's time it's not the age of the person it's the age of these problems that can exist and, and we all have a certain inherent ability to overcome problems some people more and some people less and you know you go on your merry way there's no pain associated with these things they build up very gradually in the hair follicles and that's why we like to do a hair microanalysis with people even before we recommend treatment for them because we can identify these problems before they even start to manifest. If we can get to the problem soon enough and, uh, and fix it, the person doesn't have to go through the thinning. And we can not only halt the deteriorative process, but we can bring back a certain amount of the thickness and strength into the hair shafts that has been lost. What's the primary mechanism you're using there or we, addressing? There's, like I said, we have several hundred different types of combinations, there, there and there's a, mo- a process. Is there a most common sort of issue? Well, we, we deal with receptor-binding-capable bi- elements that, in a natural way, these elements will occupy these activating receptor sites, so the, the genetic factor gets neutralized, what? and that will enhance the other aspects of Should of we be treatments. starting this in young adulthood? For Absolutely. Men? So men with a father? Absolutely. A- if there's a genetic factor, we see this all the time. We'll, we'll treat a father, and he'll do well. Jordan Next thing I know, they're, they're dragging their My son kids. in. Now, now. Rogaine is just strictly minoxidil, which is a medication that was known to have a side effect. I don't know what the, medic- the mechanism is for that. Is it similar? Well, it's a different animal completely. It, 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 it's about it, estrogen, right? It, no, it deals with fooling Mother Nature. They don't know why it works, but the way it works is holding hair in the growth cycle. Oh. You don't lose hair when it works. So, but the problem is you become reliant. Right. Because if you stop, you lose the hair you normally would lose. I tried that before. So Plus you, all the hair you're holding so on. And my hair the, would fall out when I would forget to do so, it. So you're getting something we call telogen effluvian all at once. So all the exactly. hair cycles all together and falls out all together. Yeah. What's the matter? Say that three times Telogen fast. effluvian? <laughs> <laughs> it's something that happens after pregnancy typically. Yeah, that, yeah. I had that too. Interesting. Remember? So maybe there's, gen- maybe there's a genetic component to that. And normally, it, it, pregnancy is one of those triggering mechanisms. During pregnancy, your hair is wonderful. Oh, it was amazing. And then when you give, after you give birth, the, the hormones do the flip flop, and, and then I got a, a mom lot of women, bob. a lot of women experience hair fall. Mom so, bobs. That's why everybody's <laughs> hair gets short after they have kids. So <laughs> nine or ten months later, it should come back and everything is fine. Yeah. But when it doesn't, that's when we come into play. Right. Mom bob. <laughs> You get a mom bob. <laughs> that's the that the magician work. There's a, there's a time factor involved that's in that, That's a hairdo. Too. I always thought women did something to hypnotize men. Now we're sort of learning some <laughs> of these weird tricks they do. Um, so so um, I, I want to get into what you guys do specifically, but I want to bring the surgeon in, if you don't mind now. Sure. Uh, and and so the, the question I have for you before I bring the surgeon is, how do you know you need the surgeon? We work with someone before the transplant surgery. To get the scalp tissue as healthy as possible, eliminate any problems, dandruff, psoriasis, anything like that topical. And then we refer them to the surgeon. The surgeon does the work, and then we work with the person after the transplant to strengthen the hair in and around the transplanted hair to make it look like a more natural thing. Okay, so let me bring in Dr. Parson Mohebi. He's a world-renowned hair transplant surgeon, hair restoration specialist. Dr. Mohebi, thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I could uh, join the, 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 the session. And so uh, you know you've heard what we've been talking about here. And so I, I'll ask you the same question. I mean, who, who should select, who should, who should be coming to you? Well, mostly men with male pattern hair, hair loss, as, uh, as Bill was, uh, you know, uh, reviewing the whole process. Women are also coming with, fem- uh, with male pattern hair loss. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have we have female pattern hair loss and male pattern baldness, and most of the women who are suffering from hair loss are in fact uh, suffering from male pattern baldness. So so both uh, men and women who are suffering from male pattern baldness, meaning the ones who are losing hair in a big area of the scalp, front, top, and crown, but they have a protected hair on the back area that that's male pattern baldness. So they can use hair transplants. So we use those permanent hairs on the back and redistribute them on the balding area. Let, let me interrupt you. So those hairs back here on, the, on our occiput are not prone to the DHT effects? That's correct. They're not programmed. Reason. The receptor exactly. sites are not programmed For some to reason. Activate. We don't know why or right. anything. Because ultimately you'd say, well, maybe we're going to adjust that gene up on top in one day. <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day. But uh, so, Dr. Mohammed. By the way, what? there's about 30 genes responsible for that. As, as always, right? And then epigenes that we'll find out about later. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Mohabi, um what's the procedure you do? Is there one general procedure? You, you mentioned the occiput. Is that where the hair is harvested? And does everybody get sort of the same kind of procedure? So we usually we, we get hair from the back and sides of the, the scalp, which are healthier hair. We call them permanent hair. Uh, at times, pe- people don't even have he- good hair on the back. For men, we can use beard hair. We can use body hair. We pretty much wow. can move hair from anywhere uh, to any other place. Hmm. So, hey. so sometimes jokingly to patients, I say we are, in, we are, we are, we are uh, actually moving company. So we move hair from one area to the other, <laughs> no matter what. Uh, hey. And, and, you know, I, let, me, let me sort of play listener here and say, you know, well, geez, the average listener probably thinks about hair plugs and sees things that don't look right. And how, how, how does your procedure work and avoid all that? Well, that has changed significantly. Yeah. Just in the last five years, hair transplant revolutionized. So now we do a procedure called a follicular unit extraction that under microscope, and everything is under microscope. So under microscope, we go and extract hair those healthy hairs from the back individually so there's no uh, scar or pain or tightness after the, uh, after the procedure. And then after extraction, we put them back into the areas that are mostly needed. So basically we're creating hairline and adding coverage to the top areas with the hair on the back without any cutting or any uh, you know, uh, invasive procedure. Again, continuing to play listeners, I imagine they're wondering, is it expensive? Does my insurance cover it? That kind of thing. Well, good question. Uh, well, it well, depends. Expensive depends on how, how much value you put on a full head of hair. Uh, to some pay people, it could be expensive. Usually, average price is between, you know, eight to six, $16,000. Uh, to some people, it's not a big investment for what they get. Um, insurances, unfortunately, don't cover it because they still consider it a, a, a cosmetic procedure, uh, although it can you know, save them a, a lot of money by t- t- treating depression or some other, the, you, know, you know, mental condition that comes with hair loss, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not covered by insurance. And let me ask about, say, a recalcitrant uh, alopecia areata, like somebody's just not getting better. Do, can hair transplant work there? Alopecia areata is one of those conditions that hair transplant cannot work if it's active because uh, it's an immune reaction to hair, and basically body attacks uh, hair, hair follicles. And then, so if you transplant hair into those patches, it's the it's transplanted again. hair will go through the same process. And then you use Bill's product to help the surrounding hairs and whatnot, right? We do. Actually, we, we get a lot of patients from, uh, you know, Rubinix, uh, people who have used, uh, you know, their, their products, their treatments, and we see the scalps are healthier, cleaner, and uh, it's easier for us to do our procedures, and afterwards, in fact, we use uh, one of the shampoos that they have. We did a lot of research, and we, we found that shampoo to have uh, some uh, very mild ingredients that are helping the inflammation of the skin after the procedure, and uh, it doesn't have the harmful uh, chemicals that other shampoos usually have. And this is starting to sound like a commercial for Regenix. And <laughs> full disclosure, we don't. I, I, Susan uses Regenix, and that's why we got interested yes, in talking to you. Yes, and I like you. it. I know. I know. She's a big enthusiast. But we're not. That's why take, it's here. We're not. I know. We're not taking money today. We're not doing anything like that. I use and, it. and so we're just. We just got interested in your product. Put that twenty back in my pocket. <laughs> we got interested in your product because of my wife's enthusiasm and for it. And Michelle's you, son is having hair loss problems too, and she produces the show. Right. So. And so we got more. Max, thank you for joining us. By the way, we're going we're to have more me. dermatology with you. More specifically because we just were talking about the thing you have that doesn't specifically respond to 
hair transplant. Uh, Dr. Mojave, is there a, do you want to give us a website or anything? My website is parsamohippie.com, and we have all information for prevention, for, for follow-up, and okay. we're in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. And uh, I have one question. Oh, wait, wait. I'll I have one answer. question for Dr. Mojave. Please, please. Um, yes. What is your take on the new um, uh, hair cloning? They're, they're producing hair follicles in a Petri dish. How is that going to affect your yes. work? Does that mean that you're going to have an unlimited amount of, of follicles, follicles to yeah. be able to transplant with someone? Yes, in, in theory it can. Uh, however, the, the research has been going very slowly. And uh, in the last 10 years, I've been asked that question many times in radio, TV. And the funny thing is my answer has been unchanged. When they ask me when this hair cloning will be available, I always say, eight to 10 years from now. The reason is because nobody has started the phase three of this study the clinical. to show that this, yeah, we know I, that I, how uh, do you avoid... it's working. It has been done on animals, but we don't know if it's safe and it has to go through that phase three that it takes eight to 10 years. And, and let's be like people, it sounds benign, but you can get host versus graft and graft versus host right. disease because this is a foreign body coming yeah. out. And how, well, you, it, it is not. It's not. It's not foreign body. It's your own body that is, is being cultured. They're cloning, oh, you're still, cloning your hair. so oh, many different mechanisms. Oh, 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 I beg your pardon. I thought it was just a clone, uh, sort of uh, a clone no, of hair. They're cloning your, your particular hair. hair. Wow, that's interesting. They've, yes. they've done it. Yeah, they have to take your own hair and they uh, they basically um, uh, you know multiply it. Got it. Yeah. I totally get it. All right, Dr. Mohebi, thank Thanks, you so Dr. much for joining us. We appreciate it. And uh, if anyone's interested, again, go to his website. It's P-A-R-S-A, Mohebi, M-O-H-E-B-I. So let's go back to your, your stuff and your mechanism. I, all my, all kind of, Bruce, you've been quiet. I'm not giving you a chance to talk. Go no, ahead. no, no. It's, I mean, all kinds of stuff's been flying through my head in terms of what, what this product is and how it could work. I'm waiting for the dermatology section with yes, yes, T-cell right. regulation and stem cells. And <laughs> right, and that's more at the immune system right. of alopecia areata, which is what we're going to talk about next. Right. This is really more about male, male pattern balding in men and women. We're really talking about here. Um, I, I, I'm sort of overwhelmed by this a little bit because we're sort of suggesting that the average person with a father without hair should be like starting to use this stuff in their twenties. Your stuff, right? Yeah. And, and do they have to send away for you for an analysis of what that particular person needs? Yeah, we, <clears throat> the Regenics is in a is in a like a three step process. You, you start with topical issues, kind of a preparatory stage, just dealing with anything of a topical nature. And you don't have to have a hair microanalysis done to do that. Does that include scalp disorders like seborrhea and psoriasis? Yes. Or, all of those. Anything okay. top, anything of a topical okay. nature. So, so we're talking about, the people don't know, psoriasis is a, it's a, you know, real serious, it's a significant illness. It's patches of what are called papulous squamous eruptions. Seborrhea is, is dandruff, just common dandruff. So sometimes and, psoriasis can present as dandruff. And, and, and certainly right. And dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis as well, the redness and the itching. Right. And there can be other things too. You can be reacting to your hair products or things like that, which Correct. sort of contact dermatitis of, of a sort or allergic dermatitis, that kind of thing. And do you guys look at all that? Do you analyze all that? It, it not in, well. It, I mean, what, should first see a dermatologist, I guess is the question. Should they see a dermatologist first? It wouldn't hurt yeah. to, 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 for the topical things, but we deal with people all over the world. Now, if you come into our clinic here, if you're able to come in and see us, I see we, do the, we do the topical. I, I didn't know that. Where's the clinic? <laughs> the clinic is it's in Cedar sinai Medical Office Tower. Okay, got it. And we take a look with the fiber optic scope on a microscopic level topically and look at everything okay. that's there and, and get the right treatment. Okay. Obviously, you can't do that if you're from England or Europe or somewhere right. and you're sending in hair samples to us through the mail or you're getting products to us. We, we just do a kind of an interview with the person, and, and they, you know, anecdotally we get what's going on with them, and then we try to figure things out. But that's just for the first stage. Second stage? You need, this, you need to have a hair microanalysis done, that's and we, we insist on that with everybody to get into the second stage, which is dealing with more acute problems below the scalp. Because you may send us in hair samples and find that these problems don't even exist, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in which case we wouldn't recommend our treatment for it. And then third? Is there a third stage? Third stage is after you've eliminated the problems within the hair follicles from anything from, from, from uh, sebum buildup to product residue, molecule by molecule working down, micropollution works into follicles, and of course shampoo products. I don't care how good they are. They'll only cleanse topically. They don't get into that area. So it becomes cumulative, builds up over a long period of time, many, many years. Once you eliminate those problems, 
then you can get into the the third stage of the program, which the, the, the three stages simply mean a different type of treatment formulation that you apply. The, the, third the stage. routine stays the same. And in the third stage, that's when we get into these elements that compete more aggressively for these activating receptor sites. Um, <clears throat> stimulants, rubifacients that increase blood circulation into the scalp tissue, nutrients and things like that to provide a better environment in the hair follicles. So what, is, what are you doing, Susan? What is, what is she doing? Do we know? You're, you're in the, I believe you're in the third stage now. Yes. Yeah. And so do, is it a particular potion? Uh, yeah, the, the, the potion, if you will, changes in those different do you, stages. Do you know what's in your product, Susan? Uh, I they, have I have three stages or four stages actually because I use a conditioner too. But um, but you know what this particular biology is they're going after? Or is that just you just trust them and just do well? It? There's a shampoo, there's a follicle cleanser, then there's a conditioner. You're not getting my question. And there's a protector, and then the next day, alternate day, use this yellow liquid that. That's what he's talking about. That little yellow liquid. Do you know what's in there? I I want I want to know what's in there. Okay. Do you know what's in there, offhand? I'm putting I, you on the spot. I'm sorry. Well, no, because I don't. I don't have her records yeah, right yeah, here, and yeah. I, I'd have to look at what, her what, chart. What, and, give me three or four things that are like. It, it would be it, it would, because of her background. There yeah. would be an element in there to compete aggressively for receptor sites. Uh, um, there would be a rubefacient to increase blood circulation. Okay. There would be vitamin nutrients in there. Got it. There it is. There's that yellow thing she's holding. <laughs> would this help you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, Bill, and, and and how do your how does your is an over the counter product? Yes. How does yours fit in the spectrum of other available over-the-counter products? How should somebody know they need to go to this one and we're, other we're, one? Yeah, we're different in the sense of, of it's not instant gratification. There are products out there that you can apply them and, and bam, your hair's thicker. Um, and there's a ton of products out there that are going to grow all your hair back on a bald scalp in a week and a half. Uh, really? Oh, the internet is like the wild, wild west. They, they claim that? Or they oh, yeah. No, they claim it. They claim it. And they've got pictures before and afters, and it's it's absurd. Okay. But, I was going to say. It's, yeah. <laughs> there, there's all kinds of stuff okay. out there. But uh, the difference with Regenix is, we again, we insist on doing a hair analysis yeah. first and foremost to get the person started. And then we do them every three months throughout their program. Sounds expensive. It's it's about It's about... Two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars a month for the intensive part of the program, okay. and here's the, the the good thing about Regenix is it's you don't become reliant on it. Once you kind of pay your dues, get rid of problems, stabilize things, gain some more thickness and strength back into hairs that have thinned, you can wean off gradually, go into a maintenance program. Very easy and less expensive. L- very very little cost to okay. maintain it. Bruce, any questions before I let Bill go? We no. switched to our medical conversation. Sounds good. Okay. The Bill, thank you so much for joining us. You're very Appreciate welcome. It's very interesting. And thank I, you for the opportunity. Again, it's still the landscape is kind of confusing to me because uh, when I've looked at it, people have asked me to comment. I'm like, I, I can't figure it out. But yours did always show up as, as you know, in terms of uh, patient uh, testimonials and stuff. It was very, very positive. I saw the Matthew McConaughey Yeah, almost, to, almost to the point where when, before <laughs> I had this conversation, I was like, I'm, I'm doubting this. I'm like, I'm wondering if this is real because, again, I was reared in the sort of medical aspect of this. Where we're really not trained in these over-the-counter products and things. So. Well, the big difference between us and everybody else is we're about the only company out there that tells you we don't grow hair in a bald scalp. So if the scalp's already bald, you're done. You're done. Oh, that's short of, short of a hair transplant. So that's where the hair transplant comes Correct. in. Correct. So you're about preserving hair? Pre, well, stabilizing, first of all, prevention and enhancement. That's the, the enhancement. sums it up. And, and, and it seems like the female hair, hair male pattern ball should be the one most responsive to your stuff. Is that true or no? It's, you know what? It, it, all things being equal, there's a great deal of variance. Some yeah, people yeah. just respond better and faster than others. You just never know. There's no way to predict what's going to happen. Okay. We, do, we do monitor it as we go, yeah, but we it. can't predict where we're going to end up. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to take a little break, My and pleasure. we will be right back. We are so pleased to welcome Hydrolyte back to the program. Hydrolyte is not only a product that I can safely recommend to you. It is something that I use, and Susan, my first lady of love, our producer, uses just about every day. And it is simply the best oral rehydration product I've ever tried, that I've ever seen, I wish I'd invented it myself, and there are many reasons you should keep some around. This is the time of year it is impossible to avoid getting sick, cold, flu, stomach bugs, and I think everyone knows we're in the middle of a big influenza season. They can knock you out, but staying hydrated, particularly if you get sick, is very important. Even if you manage to avoid these pathogens, your schedule is half as busy as mine. Getting in your eight glasses of water a day isn't just going to happen. And if you're working out regularly, you definitely run the risk of getting a little dehydrated, and this keeps your volume up. The beauty of Hydrolyte, whether you're sick or not, you can absolutely benefit from the proper balance of sodium, glucose, and water. 
Hydrolyte does this better than sports drinks or water alone. I know you're used to using sports drinks. This is better. I'm telling you, as a physician, I can vouch for that. Hydrolyte comes in flavors like orange, berry, and lemonade, available in a premixed drink, a powder, or what I like, the effervescent tablet. You can simply drop in a bottle of water, and then you've got it. Compared to sports drinks, Hydrolyte delivers up to four times the electrolyte with 75% less sugar. Hydrolyte solutions are appropriate for all ages, and each bottle of package includes easy-to-follow dosing instructions. You can find Hydrolyte at Rite Aid or online at Amazon. Also, for a limited time, our listeners can save 30% on Hydrolyte. Just click the banner on our website, drdrew.com. Use the code DRDREW18. That's drdrew18 at checkout. And you will save 30% on Hydrolyte, and it's silly not to do it. That's Dr. Drew 18. Hey, we're back, and welcome now Abel Torres. He's a physician and an attorney, which I'm always just fascinated gobsmacked by, by that. Yeah. that somebody somebody go, does all that training, and then all the years of dermatology that you've done and uh, have distinguished yourself. Uh, I, are you a professor of uh, dermatology? Correct. Yeah, and have been the past president of the American uh, Society of American College of Dermatology. Would that, that be right? The American Academy of Academy Dermatology. Academy of Dermatology. Um, I never know whether different, different uh, subspecialty or specialty groups have different ways of characterizing. We're, we're the American College of Physicians, Physicians you know, right. and the American Academy of this and that. Yeah. Uh, but so, Bruce, why don't you talk to us about Abel? Because you guys have been friends for a long time. Abel uh, is... A distinguished physician. I, we did internal medicine training together. And no, are you kidding me? You did you did law, medicine, and dermatology, and, right? And my my recollection of Abel is sitting in an endocrinology lecture during residency, and him not taking notes, and then afterwards regurgitating re- regurgitating everything. it. And I was, oh, I'm so jealous. And uh, on morning rounds, Abel shone, and it, as did Vilma's wife. I was intimidated, but as Drew knows, it's part it's of my easy to, It's easy to say, Bruce, but here's a situation where you should be intimidated. <laughs> I, I'm always jealous of, of dermatologists that have an internal medicine background, right? Uh, because it just it just is a I don't know, a more complete, I'm sure you know, there's a more complete thought process then, you know, in, instinctively, you know, automatically. Well, I think you're used to thinking more like in a differential diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Derms don't think that way normally. No, they do. I, I think most dermatologists do, but I think when you do internal medicine, you're used to looking at the internal as yeah. well as other things. Yeah, I, I think as an internist, the, the, all those lists we used to go through just come intuitively, automatically into consciousness. You don't have to scroll through them anymore. They're just there. Yeah, and, and I imagine that's a distinct advantage. So we're going to mostly talk – well, let's talk about dermatology generally. Um, do you mind? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, do you have any specialization, anything you like treating? My area of expertise is skin cancer. Mm-hmm. So I, I specialize in that area. I also do a lot of skin cancer surgery, most surgery, and reconstruction as it relates to that. So give a little primer on that. How, how should people be relating to dermatology? I go at least once a year and have a general check. You know, we live in Southern California where melanoma is a serious issue. I have – Things called actinic keratosis that are so precancerous right. kinds of things that I take care of with interesting ways. Uh, uh, and how often should the average person in a sun-exposed area be seeing a dermatologist? So I'd say at least once a year yeah. they should go see a dermatologist. And then they, depending on what they find at that point, then they may need to be seen more often. But I think, you know, in a warm climate, especially a dry climate like California, you'll have multiple problems. One is the sun exposure. And that leads to getting things like precancerous conditions that need to be treated uh, and can develop into skin cancer. You also get dryness of the skin and the irritations that occur from that. So sometimes by being able to see a, a doctor first, you make sure you use the proper products, that you make sure you take care of your skin the proper way. So if for nothing else, it's about a lot of prevention. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people don't think about this, but it's not just about the health of the skin. It's about the aging of the skin, too. You know, if you take care of your skin, you can keep that youthful appearance as well. So it's about helping the skin look healthy and look better. And, and if you're of our vintage, the horse is out of the barn. So as such, people like us, what should we be looking at to deal with the age, age-related age uh, changes of the skin? And, and what is that spectrum of age-related changes that people should be aware of? So bottom line, it's never too late. Um, you can always prevent some more damage. So, so get your sunscreens on. Get right. your sunscreens on. Get your hats on. And get your hats on. Avoidance of being out there in the sun, especially between the hours of like 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., which is when the sun is at its strongest. And then using moisturizers on a regular basis. Those are important things. What about wrinkle treatments? Wrinkle treatments are, you know, the, the important part there is prevention is probably one of the key points in terms of wrinkle treatments. I, I've got to say, I use uh, Retin-A products for adult acne. 
and it had a marked effect on wrinkles for me. I mean, people, I didn't really wasn't really looking for that, but people started telling me like out of the blue, like what the hell, what's going? on? I was like, oh, interesting. I, I guess it just really does have a dramatic effect. It does, and and prevention is the number one way to go. But the second way is things like vitamin A products, uh, retin A, retinol. Those kind of things will help rejuvenate the skin. It will help thicken the skin. The you know, skin gets thinner over time. It will help even out the pigmentation of the skin because you get uneven pigmentation. So it will help regenerate that skin and make it look younger. The thing that people have to realize that it's not a magic bullet. You can't just put it on one week and next week you expect it to look better. You Forever. have to do this regularly. Forever. But yet women spend a avogadro's number of dollars on products that are, to me look like nothing. Why don't they go to the dermatologist and get properly treated if they want to deal with wrinkles? Isn't that wise? A combination of factors. One is marketing. You know, marketing can sell products a certain way, and people will be convinced that's the case. The other thing is that some of these creams have basically some little retin A in there anyway. They have a, yeah. some of them have retinols yeah. or retin A yeah. type products, but they also have other things like lubricants that help the skin kind of absorb the fluid and look better. So you can put eye creams and other things that make the skin look tighter and younger, but it's temporary. Now, in this age of gatekeepers, so people have to get a referral from their primary care physician. Now, you're saying people should see a dermatologist once a year. That fly, I mean, to get a I won't say what system I'm in, but to get into a dermatologist is not always that easy. Absolutely right. And so, you know, that that is one of the problems that you do run into in terms of being able to get to see that specialist. I think, you know, healthcare is learning, though, that they pay a price when they don't do the preventive care. So they're beginning to move back towards some preventive care. So it's a right, not a luxury. Correct. (laughs) Now, what about taking pictures of uh, pigmented lesions or nevi or moles are always, even in the emergency room, you get questions. No matter what kind of a physician you are, I think people go, hey, doc, you mind taking a look at this? And what are the guidelines? And then the other thing I've heard is you should take a picture every year. I don't know if that's any kind of advice of your body or of your moles and see how they change. I don't know so much that you have to take a picture, but you should look at your skin. I'd say at least once a month, people should go and take a look at their skin right after they take a shower. Go out there, look in the mirror, or use your significant other and have them take a look at your skin. Your back is hard, though, right? Yeah, very hard. That's why the significant other is helpful. And if you see anything that looks suspicious, you take a picture of it. And that picture is something you can share with your physician, or you can at least use that picture to follow it and see if that's changing. If anything's changing in any way, that's a danger sign. When you talk about pigmented lesions, we talk about the A, B, C, D, E's. A is asymmetry. That means if you look at a spot and you split it right down the middle, it should look about the same on both sides. If Mm -hmm. it's not, that's a bad sign. B is the border. Are they sharp or are they fuzzy? Fuzzy is not a good sign. C is the color. Is the color irregular versus even? Even is good. Irregular is bad. So certain colors are bad, white and blue. Um, that When you get to the white and blue, though, it's a more advanced stage. So you but should really get it it's way bad. before you get there. <laughs> okay, yeah, good, absolutely. Okay. And then D is the diameter in terms of is it bigger than about a, the size of a pencil head eraser? Why do we use that size? It's really arbitrary, and that is that your eye can really not tell as well the nuances when it's smaller than that. Mm-hmm. But if you see something that's that big and it shows changes, you worry about it. Now, but really quick, though, my understanding is that the majority, and it's not a big majority, but the majority of melanomas occur in non-sun exposed areas. And, and so people are always examining their sun exposed areas, but they need to examine their non, including their scalp, right? So I don't know that I is would that say, that I, would, I don't think I would say the majority don't, but a significant number will occur in non sun exposed areas because they can occur in prior existing moles. So they can uh, occur in places like the scalp. Also, the scalp, believe it or not, gets enough sun because people who are out there, you're in the water, it gets wet. I've I've certainly seen plenty on the buttock and areas like that, too. Absolutely. I think, Michelle, didn't you have a friend that had vaginal melanoma? Oh, and I've seen seen ophthalmological melanoma. Right. uh, That's correct. Devastating. Now, the the other thing that's come up, people are getting tattoos like crazy, and then people are getting tattoo removal. So you depigment everything. Is, Is there any kind of trend that you're seeing where people are missing lesions because of their tattoos or they got tattoo removal and there's no i want tattooed to cover my actinic changes i figure, I figure i'm gonna get it late in life and that's my plan so i don't know that i would say there's a then trend. they won't sag when i'm older they'll still be brand new tats or... except the tattoo may sag so you have to think of that yeah right <laughs> but but in terms of um i don't know that there's a trend in terms of the pigment thing per se but the problem with tattoos is they can hide things so if you have a lesion in that area you may miss uh, the changes that occur there the other thing that happened was that with tattoos, people can get allergic reactions to the pigment that's Especially put into the Especially the red skin. mercury. The red mercury yeah. and other pigments. And so that can create problems as well. So those are the kind of issues. And then if you do have some color changes, people may miss, like I, like I mentioned, in terms of the skin cancer. Okay. So what other are, 
general things people going to their primary care physician might not have addressed. There's aging skin. I, I remember you telling me once you could tell a person that smokes just from looking at their skin. You told me that about 30 years ago. That's, that's actually correct. So, so what happens is, you know, when you smoke, you're cutting down on the oxygen in your skin, and there's other free radicals that are formed as well. So what ends up happening is it denatures the collagen. It changes the collagen in the skin. And so you'll see some of the uh, this, uh, increased wrinkling that will occur in that skin, not to mention some of the color changes and texture changes as well. So if you look at smokers, usually around their mouth, you see those very prominent wrinkles that are there. Right. And you look at their faces, and you'll see a lot more wrinkles as well. What are we going to do with laxity? Are we ever going to correct that? Um, <laughs> I, I'm sure at some point there will be some cure Something. we can find, but we're not, not there now. yet. And uh, I used to hear a lot more about dysplastic nevus syndrome. Has that become less popular in the dermatology community? Why, why am I hearing less about that? So it, it was the dysplastic nevus yes. is what it was, it, was, uh, it was about. It's not that it's become it, – it's just that we understand it better now. So at one point what happened is if you look at moles – Everybody will probably have a dysplastic mole on their body. Right. It's when you have a certain number of those moles, and there's a family history associated with that. I just had patients getting all their moles taken off, and I didn't couldn't understand why. And I was like, mm, you had one dysplastic nevus that does not make the dysplastic nevus syndrome, right? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. One dysplastic nevus does not make yeah. dysplastic nevus so, syndrome. So they're a little less aggressive with it now. Correct. I had one question. Yeah, go ahead. Go you ahead. were sort of one of the grandfathers of Mohs surgery, and I have people ask me all the time no about it. No kidding. Yeah. Damn, I'm jealous of your background. So, um, you know, Mohs surgery basically was named after a fellow named Frederick Mohs. Uh M-O-H. M-O-H-S. And he developed it basically as a medical student where he was doing studies on uh, cancers and he was trying to find a way to process the tissue. Can I interrupt a second? Have I been misspelling his name all this time? I've been I've been doing it as M O H apostrophe S. Was his name M O H S? No, it's Apo- it's M O H S. Uh, it was his Mose, real name. Mose, yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, Frederick Mose. I Me thought too. it was. Yeah, I put apostrophe yeah. S in there. Okay, so go ahead. So so basically, he was using this for actually research in terms of uh, taking tumors out and looking at them, and then thought of the idea of well, can we apply this to tumors? And many years back, this is at a time when. Nobody else wanted to touch these big tumors, and so he could put this paste. It was a chemical paste on the skin, and it was used to cut out these tumors, and it would basically kill the tissue, including the tumor, around it. Over time, that developed into what we call frozen sections, which is that now we don't use the chemical anymore. You just basically cut out the skin, but you use his same principles of how you process the tissue and you look at it so that you're looking at a lot more of the tissue than you normally would in pathology. So normally, let's say you're looking at 1% or less of the total tissue when you look at it. Right. In Mohs, you're looking at about 80 to 90% of the tissue. So it's carving out slowly little pieces of the tumor and, and the surrounding the extensions. tissue. Yeah. But it's also cosmetically better too, is it not? Well, the reason is it's cosmetic. If normally, when you go to surgery, if they're going to cut out a skin cancer, yeah. they cut out an arbitrary amount of skin to make sure it's out. And so then you're left with a bigger defect. If you can, instead of arbitrarily taking skin out, you cut it out only for what you need to do, yeah. then you preserve tissue so it's more cosmetic in that sense. I Just one other thing, Dermat- dermatopathology. So pathologist looks under the microscope at stuff, sort of they're the they're people that... And then dermatopathology is a specialty in dermatology. Or are you pathology? A, are you a derma, dermatopathologist? No, I'm not a dermatopathologist. There are some dermatologists that specialize in that. Yeah, okay. you can, there's two ways that you can make, become yeah. a dermatopathologist. You can be a pathologist that becomes a dermatopathologist, or you can be a dermatologist that becomes a dermatopathologist. Okay. Every dermatologist, though, gets a lot of training in dermatopathology. Right. So you end up getting uh, uh, several months of training in dermatopathology over your training. And then if you do something like Mohs surgery, you actually spend a year, sometimes two years, just doing a lot of dermatopathology on skin cancer. So you actually have a lot more experience with skin cancer than a lot of pathologists. If I get a skin, if I get a biopsy, should I be as, you know, everybody's into quality control. You want to know you're either Googling the doctor, look at his background. Do you want to know who your pathologist is looking at your slide? Absolutely. I think if you have a skin biopsy, a dermatopathologist should be the one looking at it simply because they can understand a lot of the diseases a lot better and have a lot more experience. Let's think about it this way. If you have a pathologist, very well trained, excellent physicians. But if you only spend 5% of your time looking at skin, that's the experience you have. If you spend 100% of your time looking at skin, you're going to do a lot better than the guy that does it 5%. Just logical. I, I'm going to, sort of a physician question, but I'm a little confused about when 
a basal cell, which is a certain kind of skin cancer, should be treated with a like a liquid nitrogen versus a shave biopsy versus just put Aldera cream on there. Okay. Is there is there a differentiation amongst those three categories? So yes, no, a very important differentiation. So the the bottom line is this: basal cells, most basal cells are not life threatening. Right, they're self limited. Right? They're more there. of a nuisance uh, that are that need to be treated. They do have the potential to be life threatening. They do have the potential to spread and be pretty destructive. They can go up nerve roots and things. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah. They can get what's called perineural involvement yeah. when they do that. Yeah. And so, and they can metastasize. It's uncommon, but it does happen. So you treat them because you want to prevent that from happening. But because they're most of them are not life threatening and they grow very slow over time, many treatments are effective up to a point. So you can get uh, what's called scraping and burning or electrodesiccation and curatage, and that can work for a good number of basal cells. Usually that works best if you have an area where it's thick skin, uh, like on the back, for example, and it's a very small lesion or a thin lesion, then that works very well. If you have a lesion that's more aggressive, that's infiltrating, then that's not a good idea because the tumor can go bigger. So freezing in some circumstances, I mean, the uh, scraping may be better in that circumstance. What about freezing? Yes, you can do freezing for a skin cancer as well, but it's not what most people think. Most of the time when people think of the freezing, it's when we, they get the little squirt of spray from the doctor Liquid nitrogen. For, the pre, for the pre-cancers, the mm, actinic keratosis. Yeah. That's very superficial. Yeah. When you actually treat a basal cell, you have to treat it so it gets to minus 90 degrees or greater. Yeah. And either you have to use either tissue tro- uh, probes to measure that temperature, or you have to physically v- evaluate that there's a certain amount of freezing that takes place. So it's a much bigger process and a much bigger thing than people realize. But yes, it can be done in selective circumstances. When? If you have a patient that doesn't tolerate surgery, that has a lot of other medical problems, you may want to avoid the surgery and you can use the freezing if it's the right type of lesion, a superficial basal cell. Um, you talked about imiquimod. Imiquimod, an excellent medication. Uh, I use it on AKs all the time. It's oh, crazy. It's very good. And, and it stimulates the immune system to destroy the lesions, mm-hmm. which is one of the nice things about it. So it can be useful. Um, it is approved right now only from the neck down, not approved from the neck up. Which is when you'd think you'd want to use it. it because, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and the reason for that is the way the studies were done right. and the fact that the liability that goes with it, the of companies course. didn't want to right. go through that. Of but it can be used, and it's, it's very useful for superficial basal cell. But you have, again, <clears throat> all these treatments are good. The important thing is if you treat, make sure there's follow-up. Follow up. Yeah, I get that. All right, now we're going to switch gears. Ready? All right, Max, welcome to the program. I know you've been sitting here very, very, very patiently. <laughs> you want to become a dermatologist. <laughs> he was just giving a little bit of training. Uh, and we also have Max's dermatologist with us. His name is Hal Weitzbach. He is a assistant clinical professor of medicine at UCLA. He's also the medical director of the Calabasas Dermatology Center, which is where you guys live, although you're now in Michigan State. I see all the Spartan gear on you right now. Well done. Got to represent. Go Spartans. <laughs> uh, and, and tell us your story real quick, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Um, my freshman year of college, I'm a sophomore now, but my freshman year about a uh, month in or so. Actually, it goes back to my senior year of high school. I was playing baseball, and I was a catcher. So I had a. Uh, I noticed one day that my uh, I had like a little spot, like where no hair was. I was a little shocked by it. And when I we we kept looking at, it, and then I when I got a haircut, I had the same exact spot, identical on the other side of the back of my head. No pain, no tenderness, nothing. No, there. no, no. I didn't. Even, I actually thought I accused the uh, the barber of screwing up the haircut, <laughs> <laughs> and she actually told me it was alopecia areata. And oh, I, she and, recognized and, it, and I was like, "There's, there's no way." And then um, a couple months later, at school, my freshman year, um, that that uh, same spot started to grow a little bit, and I got increasingly concerned until the point where one morning I woke up and I got in the shower, and everything kind of started coming, and um, and that's kind of where it started. So increasingly it started losing hair and probably I'd say in about two weeks I was I don't know how much I'd say it was gone but enough to where I was like done with hair for the moment <laughs> Did, all, all over your skin yeah yeah all over there's different spots and then I, when did you see Dr. White spot? Uh, probably in he like was in the fall. Yeah, of your, was your freshman year last yeah, year? Yeah probably like October November and, and, and what did you find when he came in? Well, Max didn't have much hair when he came in the office. Uh, the alopecia areata is pretty advanced, almost alopecia totalis at that point, where there was almost no hair on the scalp. Um, he was pretty dis- distraught, as you'd imagine. And we discussed what could be happening. And um, at some point, there, it came up that he had a thyroid issue that he, they had found at Michigan, I believe. Yeah, it, it was uh, going into my freshman year. I knew that I had a – they they had – I test, took a blood test and they said I had a hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. Yeah. 
And you, you had uh, Graves' disease, or did you have? Yeah, a- yeah, technically. But then later on, they diagnosed it as hyper uh, uh, thyro- uh, thyroiditis. Sorry, thyroiditis. Yeah, thyroiditis. Oh, interesting. And interesting. Um, because my acute, I actually, acute, acute thyroiditis. Yeah, right? you went up right. and you went down. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Um, when did they I, biopsy I, your thyroid just out of curiosity? Did they uh, like that? No, they did okay. an ultrasound. Ultrasound. Yeah. Ultrasound. yeah. yeah. Okay. But they uh, they noticed that. Um, I started taking uh, medication methamazole. Methamazole. Yeah, and uh, as I was uh, taking it, that's when like everything started happening, and I figured that it was related to the medication and being on it because my hy- my thi- hypothyroidism had dropped to yeah. hypothyroidism. Right. So. And you see, so you figured the methamazole was causing the hair loss too. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And Dr. Um, Weitzbach, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, it was a combination issue. So the medication can cause the hair loss, but also alopecia areata is considered an autoimmune condition. So related to thyroiditis and a lot of the other conditions it can be related to. So we figured it was definitely a systemic condition that it was showing up in his hair. Um, but the, and the question is, how do you treat this scalp? How do you get this freshman in college in Michigan State having a good time, wants his hair back? How do we get <laughs> his hair back? And yeah. I mean, alopecia areata, like tell patients all the time, it's, it's a difficult condition like vitiligo. Um, vitiligo the, is the uh, depigmentation of the skin. So go ahead. Right. It's another autoimmune condition. The body's attacking pigment or alopecia areata. The body's attacking the hair. And the issue is we can treat it, but a lot of times it's resistant. It doesn't respond. Or when you do treat it, it gets better. And then a new spot pops up. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. Mm-hmm. You can treat one area and then another area gets, comes up and you, you keep chasing your tail in that regard. So we started one of the you know, most common treatments you do for alopecia areata, which was um, intralesional Kenalog. We injected steroids into um, prednisone or triamcinolone into Max's scalp at a low concentration, but a large volume because his whole scalp was involved. Ouch. And if you see him right now, it's unbelievable. He comes in our office and he gets like a round of applause from the entire <laughs> staff. It's that, we're, one of our, yeah. we're so happy for him. It's unbelievable. And, and that was it? The Kenalog did it? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Oh, man, long. that's yeah. lucky. Yeah. Max has a very good pain tolerance. Max came in many times <laughs> yeah. throughout the year. And he wanted his hair, man. Hundreds yeah. and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of injections by now. You know, Every month or so, whenever he was in town, by myself and the nurse practitioner, Emily Kraft, in our office at the Calabasas Dermatology Center. And um, he tolerated it. He, he bit the bullet and... And it, yeah, it shows. I mean, his scalp's doing amazing now. It's pretty I, amazing. I am surprised that it had such a dramatic response for the very reason that you uh, opened with, which is that it is a little whack a mole and it usually is difficult to treat. But did you have a plan up your sleeve what, what you would do if it didn't work? Well, we talked about this with Max, and we said, I mean, when we first met, uh, we'll do what we can, but if, if you get all of your hair back, this can be not a miracle, but up there. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's not expected. Oh, that must have felt good. Yeah. Freshman it, in college. It actually didn't. It, I actually gave up on it kind of throughout the year. It wasn't there wasn't there was some results. It was getting gradually better. But you came a skinhead. You just shaved. Yeah, I, mean, down. I shaved it off yeah. probably when I came back for uh, after winter break last yeah, yeah. year. And I was, I was basically living a time with it's a cool look. In nineteen seventy six, it would have been a. <laughs> it would have not worked out. I also, so well. I also looked out that I went to a school that's twenty degrees half the time. Right. So I wear a beanie yeah, a lot. But right. um, did yeah. you go through a lot of frustration? The other doctors, people not really yeah. figuring out. What I had, was I had a, a my thyroid doctor was. Uh, uh-oh. I don't want to go there. <laughs> no um, names. Yeah, uh, no names. Uh, but it wasn't until about I'd say July that I that every it just started really really coming in this like last July like coming back. Yeah, yeah coming in um, uh, July August the summer and then all of a sudden I came into school just very very full headed. Did it in any way growing. correlate with the resolution of your thyroiditis? Um, yeah, in a way I'd say like yeah. definitely I it's it's self stabilized because I stopped the medication after my hair fell out yeah. and and then a couple of weeks after I got a blood test and my thyroid actually did self regulate. Was there any tenderness later. in your thyroid or anything? No. Was there a goiter or nothing mm-hmm. you could see? No. Now just, is there, uh, just in general, is there? I just know I've been reading about T cell regulation and stem cells and genetic issues. Is there any family history of autoimmune problems or? I think my grandma had a. A thyroid issue? Should it any removed? rheumatoid arthritis but, in the family? Yeah. My mother just had her, 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 had part of her thyroid removed ma, ma, when she was young. Yeah, but that's not. Was with parathyroid yeah, no, that wouldn't affect. She's saying parathyroid and thyroid. Did you guys do the color dot com or any of the other? I don't think color would detect anything like this. I don't. The, uh, any other genetic studies though? No. How, how, Dr. Weitzbach, anything? Did you have any thoughts that way of going down a rheumatic path? Well, I mean. I thought it was related to the thyroid condition, and it was definitely autoimmune in that re- that sense. Yeah. And it, when I had met Max, he actually had already was going back to hypothyroid and was getting more stabilized. Yeah. And so 
at that point, we said, okay, well, hopefully this is related to what happened and then we're going to move forward from this point forward and uh, in, initiate treatment. See, and I think he touches an important point. I mean, he did, he did a wonderful job. Yes, clearly. Uh, I think he hasn't emphasized enough how much the hair may not have come back as well, so that's really good. And if you see those on Facebook or if you're watching this, I mean, Max has a not just a normal head of hair, yeah. he has an exceptional head of hair. Very thick. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you know, the other fact, thing, would you mind putting some cortisone in my scalp uh, after, after this? <laughs> the other credit goes to Max too. I mean, it, 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 those injections are not fun. Oh yeah. And he went through that process, and I can tell you, I get, I, have, I treat football players that sometimes you inject with one injection, they and they're cry. out like a light. Oh really? <laughs> so yeah. so that, that's a credit to you too, Thank Max. You. Yeah, I, I think the one of the issues that comes up here that's important too is that. Um, you know, sometimes everything starts coming together as well in terms of different problems because you have the alopecia areata, then you'll have telogen effluvium, which is a hair loss that occurs just when there's any kind of a stress in the body. Mm -hmm. So you get a mixture of the telogen effluvium, the alopecia areata, then you add a medication to the mix, and then you can get a medication issue as well. Mm -hmm. So sorting all that out and getting the treatment to work properly is is important. And, and, and and the thyroid, you know, it has ancillary autoimmune activity. So there's an autoimmune effect of the thyroid. And there's just hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Both can make you lose hair, right? Correct. Yeah. So Correct. there's all these elements going And both in. of those can lead to the telogen effluvium as well. Oh, because of which is just, it would, again, to review what that is, just the hair timing all at once and falling out all at once. Correct. So. How many effluviums are there? So <laughs> I can't tell you how many effluviums. But, but the key thing about telogen effluvium that's important is that it doesn't happen right away. You have a stress that occurs, and then the hair shifts into a resting phase of growth. So then what happens is it's not until the hair start growing again that it pushes those hairs out, and then you see. So that may occur several months down the line. That's why after pregnancy, can three, you see it doesn't months. happen right after yeah. the pregnancy, yeah, three, several months, later, months later. Yeah. Is there a common pathway? Does stress produce a immune change, or is what's the pathway? Well, of course. For stress? It has to, right? But is that why the hair fall? Oh, I mean, is, no. it, is it like... Stress is no. very involved with hair loss in all right. skin conditions, definitely. So I mean, again. eczema, psoriasis, even acne. Finals week, everyone breaks out with acne. But what's, the, me- what's the mechanism? Is it based on a stir, a change in cortisol levels, or... Well, probably mostly T- steroid levels, yeah. T-cells, or... All right, you guys, we got to kind of wrap things up here. We're, we're, we're getting into the physician weeds, which I know Can really I get my, t- turns us on. I, but I, have a makes, cup, I have a couple lesions here. And <laughs> yeah, I'll, buy, I'll listen whenever I get around. <laughs> well, this one the thing about dermatology. It's one of those professions where everyone's like, would you mind? Everybody, even physicians, would you, would you look at my, I have this AK here. And uh, Max, uh, any thoughts about as being a patient in the in the, in the uh, focus of all this? You want to? I mean, I, I just the only thing I'd say is I he, when he when we first started, he said if I, I'm not sure the exact number, but he said if you if you even see this much come back, like we'll like he said we'll, we'll consider, consider a triumph. Yeah, and um, so that in a way that gave me a lot of a good outlook when I started to see come, some of it come back. But at the same time, I I've been very ni- uh, cynical about the whole situation or skeptical. I'm sorry. Um, about the whole situation, and I really haven't expected any growth to come back. So the fact that I got to this point, I'm very happy with. We started PTP. Uh, I think is that what it's PRP. called? PRP. Sorry. Um, what, plasma. Pl- yeah, plasma injections. Does that work? Is that Dr. White Is that necessary here? So platelet-rich plasma is a newer thing on the horizon for for hair growth over the last couple of years in dermatology, and it's been used for joints for a while. And it, there's more data coming out, anecdotal, that it works for alopecia or helps for alopecia areata. And there's while well, Max's hair came back patchy at first and then eventually filled in full from the steroid, there's a, a, a somewhat decent-sized patch on the back of his scalp over the, by the occiput, almost like an ophiasis pattern that is resistant, hasn't come back. So now we're looking for alternative treatments. And that's, that are the, not P- and that's the PRP? Mm. Yes. Platelet-rich plasma. And the, plate, well, the platelet-rich plasma brings all these inflammatory mediators in with it. And the, and my mediators, I mean both D and... Growth increase, factors. The growth it's factors, actually yeah. the platelets have all the growth factors, and you're injecting a high concentration of those platelets with the growth factors at the, into the, the base of the hair shaft to try to stimulate the hair growth. That's correct. Yeah. And, and uh, again, we don't know all about it yet. It's still being understood. But I think it's, uh, you're lucky because what he's doing is the correct thing because the ophiasis pattern which he's talking about is where the hair in the back sometimes will not grow back very well, and it's very common to see that. But if you can get it early on, you may be able to get that hair to come back. Yeah, I do I do have the hairline back here, but then there's just that – there's like a spot that's still slow to – 
to really Sorry, respond I bet to the... Come, I bet it'll come back. Yeah. That's my prediction. Your hair's long Humbly. enough to cover Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's coming back. <laughs> Humbly. Just about over it. Any advice for us as physicians? Should we... You, know, you, you, you pointed something out here. You said he gave us, you gave us a realistic but somewhat pessimistic point of view, so you were overjoyed by the mm-hmm. fact that these... Would you rather us be optimistic in our predictions or, or well, more frank- realistic and pessimistic when the outcomes are likely to be not so good? Yeah, frankly, I, I was... As a patient. I was, I was kind of tired of, you know... People telling me, "Oh, it'll come back." Oh, this that. You want to um, hear the reality? Yeah, I was I was kind of sick of like hearing all this. I was like, "Well, if I got to prepare to like live this way, you yeah, know, as a 19 year old, like I might as well like get." So that's why I've kind of just been in the idea that you know, what if this happens again? I'm I'm always very um, prepared prepared for it. So I I I thank him for kind of giving me the real the realistic outlook to it. But at the same time, he's also kept me like understanding that i am making progress and that this that this can be resolved yeah. too good so yeah. that's good advice I, yeah. I just had an eye procedure and they didn't tell me about the dryness afterwards and i've been are you still <laughs> using those drops yes i've been driven crazy by it Wait, but the last time i, I was in hang on last time i was in i went i went is this just my life and is this just what's going to be they're like oh no no it'll get back well why don't you tell me that i have <laughs> a question oh, about yeah. hair we'll yeah. stop talking about yeah. your eyes um <laughs> <laughs> i love you sweetie go ahead i know um okay so the plasma uh, injections don't they do that for your skin as well, right? The face, yeah. and also, could you do that for pattern baldness? Do you so want- we use yeah. PR, PRP, platelet rich plasma, um, sometimes with microneedling for the skin, like on the face for rejuvenation. Um, also, we use it for uh, male pattern uh, and female pattern hair loss, androgenetic alopecia on the scalp. Again, like Dr. Torres said, I mean, it's it's new, it's newer in terms of the, the amount of patients who are being treated now, and so the data isn't huge and we don't know fully how great it can be or how great it is um but there is a lot of evidence that shows some a lot of people do respond and uh, can get a lot of hair growth is about. prp and stem cell essentially in the same category when we talk about them together they no it's a, it's a little different here it's basically the platelets are rich um in some of those substances yeah. and you're getting a concentrated amount because yeah. you're you're pulling it all together by centrifuging yeah. it and concentrating well, it i I've, I've seen clinics where nurses are running the Derm clinic, and they have the machine. They spin down your blood, and then they inject it. What do you right? That's what any they comments do, right? on the Isn't that commercialization? What they do? So there's two ways. Yes. So the, the problem is, it is being commercialized a lot, and sometimes yeah. it's being touted to do more than it actually does. But I think it is a promising technique. I think there's a lot more to be learned about it. But what about it is stem useful. cells? What about stem cells? Stem cells are also a promising good. technique, but again, right now it's being touted way beyond where we are. Right. Um, I think with, with PRP, one of the issues is it's not just about injecting it you can also put it on topically depending if you use something that will absorb help the absorption for it so when it's used it's used in two ways sometimes it gets injected sometimes you actually use something like a micro needling which will make a little holes in the skin so that it helps the absorption which one works better it's not clear it makes probably injection makes sense but it's not clear there may be a, pl- a role for both of those you good and you can do that on your scalp you can do that on the scalp. You can do it on the like face or other places. That would be more the PRP, like like what Max is having. <laughs> yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate everyone's participation. Really a privilege to meet you, Abel. Bruce has talked about you over the years. I've, I've heard your name come up here and there, and I appreciate finally meeting you now. It's a privilege. Judge Weisbach, thank you for joining us, and thank you for helping Max out. We really appreciate it, okay? Thanks for having me. And uh, again, Bruce. Great this is show. A really interesting show. I, I have mean, more questions. but I, I know, but we, the, we, we were going into the physician category yeah, right, right. a little bit, and, and I think listeners can only tolerate that so much. Yeah. We, can, we can talk amongst ourselves afterwards. Maybe What's I'll that? come back. Yeah, come on back by all means. Yeah, both of you guys are be a sure. privilege because I think I think derm is. I mean, we we should be really thinking about it for for podcasting because derm is something that pe- everyone kind of thinks about, worries about both the largest organ in the body and right. cosmetically, medically. We really you know we could just there's a lot of stuff to get into there. And just one last thing, I want to remind everybody that uh, Regenix is very kindly. Bill has very kindly offered our listeners uh, a special fifteen percent discount if you click through at Regenix dot com. That's R E G E N I X dot com. Use the promo code Dr. Drew, D-R-D-R-E-W, and you have 15% off their product. So go click through and uh, take advantage of this very special and very kind offer for our listeners. If you're uh, persuaded, uh, certainly the First Lady of Love is, so check it out. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Remember, you can find all these podcasts at drdrew.com. The Dr. Drew podcast, the This Life podcast with Dr. Drew and Bob Forrest, and the Adam and Drew podcast, which is available five days a week. Find them all on iTunes and rate us five stars. Subscribe and get it first. And if you're really happy, click on the Amazon banner at drdrew.com to help support the show. We'll thank you for it. 
If you join the email list via drdrew.com slash contact, we'll send you a weekly infusion newsletter with Dr. Drew's news. We're so grateful when you get in touch. We read all your emails and we'll bring you the subject matter you want to hear about. 